There were five, there were five that were runaway, runaway leaders. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll spend time on those five. And I'll just go, I'll just kind of go down from the, I'll hit the two that tied. There was two that tied for first and then the next three all tied as well. I, I knew, use, I, I did this with one other group of people and this was, for them, this was the runaway. It, it wasn't as much with you guys, but close. And that was that balance is a myth. And I, it, that always gets people because, um, oh, <laughs> you guys want my version. Of, it's not quite as funny as those, J, those R. Kelly videos. But do we have Parents Matter a lot? Is that one of these? Oh, we do. Okay, I'll skip, I'll skip that then. Well, we'll start with Parents Matter because I don't know how to go out of order. We'll come back to, we'll come back to balance is a myth. The parents matter a lot thing. Here's 10 things not to say to parents. Number 10, don't worry about it. <laughs> hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Nosy. <laughs> Quit being so nosy. Um, number, number nine, what's the big deal? <laughs> Lighten up. Lighten up, mom. What's the big deal? Number eight, I'm sure if you left your daughter at camp, there was a good reason. <laughs> don't, don't say that. Number seven, about the minivan we borrowed. <laughs> Don't, don't say that. Number six, and you think that's my fault? You don't, you don't want to say that. Number five, I know you're disappointed, but he's only following the behavior modeled at home. <laughs> After all, you have 30,000 hours. I only have 42, right? Number four, if I were you, says the 22-year-old youth pastor. <laughs> Number three, look. If you would just spend a little more time with your child. Number two, calm down. <laughs> How many of, I mean, let's be honest. We've all said calm down. Like, calm, calm down. Let's, let's put down the weapon. Um, number, number one, not to say to parents, trust me. Trust me. Um, parents matter a lot. Um, they matter more today than they ever have. Just just to get the conversation started, how have you seen the role of parents and the importance of this third leg, how have you seen that change, A, and B, what is the felt need for all of us that makes us vote this as one of the, the things that stuck out out of 25 things? This was one that stuck out. Um, how have things changed and what's the felt need that, that we're sensing? Just, just throw that stuff out there. Yeah. Okay, both parents working. Club sports. Club sports. How does that tie into parent? I know that ties into busyness of kids. Yeah, alongside like just the demotion of church. Along, so they're spending more time with mom and dad. Yep. Outside of church. Yep. Which ties into, believe it or not, the high cost of college education. Sure. Parents think my kid can get a scholarship if, right? At six years old, man, if she just, she just sticks with this soccer thing, <laughs> she could be me a ham. I mean, parents feel that pressure, right? Whatever we can do to. What else? What else has changed? Having living a kid living with two parents, same thing. Less and less. Yep. yep. Which makes it way tougher on us to minister to parents, right? How do we partner with parents when they're not they're, they're not on the same page most of the time? They're not on the same roof. Um, the parent that we think maybe is having the, the most negative impact on the student is the one who's the least connected to the church or, or whatever. It's it's hard. It makes our job it's twice as hard now for us to partner with mom and dad. Parents who see their kids more as an inconvenience than I mean they really don't want the role of being a parent. Yeah. They had a kid because they had sex as opposed to starting a family. Right. Lots of discussion about helicopter parents. We're going to talk about that. It's one of the things I've seen change in the last 10 years. Um, but we forget there's still a whole lot of absentee, neglectful parents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who I think they would say, I love my kid, most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. But man, it's, 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 the, op it's the exact opposite of the helicopter kid, of the, of the, of the helicopter parent. And I'm not sure it's any less damaging. It's very interesting. It's very interesting, the two dynamics and how, they, and how those two 
show up in the lives of kids. Passive dads. Passive dads. Like not like sitting in church. Passive dads. So that's how things have changed. How how have those changes? What's the felt need that all of that is somehow collectively causing us to feel? Filling the gap. <laughs> we're, we're trying to fill in a gap. Does, when we look at the reality, because we can't argue with the numbers of 30,000 hours versus whatever it is. I'm not sure why they said 42, but they take a couple weeks off, I guess. Um, but okay, let's just say you know, 60 hours or 52 hours. That's a massive gap. Why do we feel the pressure to fill that gap? And that's, that's not a rhetorical question. I don't have an answer. I'm, 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 I'm with you. But why, why do we feel that? We recognize the power of a, a significant other in the life of a teenager, which most of us can probably personally, I'm, my, I'm, I don't, I'm not the only one with the John Miller story in this room. I'm not the only one. Lots of us have those stories. Other, other, other felt needs that this, this change in, 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 in parenting and the, the home dynamic is causing us to, to feel. We see it as not being reaffirmed, what we're saying being reaffirmed at home in the home. We feel like we need to reaffirm it more so that it sticks better. Okay. It's not being reaffirmed. Yep. Anymore. Yep. So we feel like, it, I mean, it's, it's kind of another way of filling in the gap, right? Maybe not individually, John Miller style, but um, programmatically, we feel the pressure to make sure we're covering and teaching and educating kids in ways that we're pretty convinced mom and dad aren't. So, which is classic youth ministry. We're the disciplers of kids, you know, is, is how we're perceived and, and, and it's the gap we feel. We, we don't just fill a relational gap or a presence gap, we fill a discipleship gap, in, in a, a, you know, an education gap in the lives of Christian church kids. I think you're kind of saying this even, but our role as a youth pastor, you leader, you know, it's not just about the Bible and the spiritual, Maybe maybe money and financial management, maybe it's time management, maybe it's there's all kinds of things. It's not just spiritual guidance. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 the brunch break was talking about in Philadelphia how they do these basic. I don't want to call them classes, but they're like little short-term small group learning centers where the they learn to cook, they learn to work on cars, they learn construction because absent parents. The, the changing of our culture where everything's screen driven, right? I mean, there's just some basic skills that kids don't know these days. And sometimes we feel the pressure to give them more than just a biblical literacy, but we feel the pressure to give them like life literacy. And where else are they getting it? I think that goes with, with the whole culture now instead of, like, I think the need is more felt now. Like 10 years ago, you didn't have instant social couldn't see parents in their everyday life. And so I think now, like you said, it's trending to be more and more of where the parents matter. And I think some of that is because like now you can see what their home life is like. Yeah. Unless you, you couldn't see it before. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. we, we have more information about our congregation, our, our, our students, than we've ever had before. <coughs> and that includes mom and dad. Because mom and dad are, you know, well, they're Facebook machines nowadays. <laughs> Teenagers, not so much. Have you noticed the only, the only place I've ever seen the social media trend reversed is Twitter? Everywhere else, teenagers jump on, adults come in later, and teenagers migrate off. Twitter's the only one that's been the opposite. Adults jumped on Twitter first. And right now, teenagers are, are just now starting to become more and more... On, on, on Twitter. It's the only time that that's, that that's been reversed. Kind of interesting. Has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind of interesting.
kind of interesting. So what do we do? What are you guys doing? Who, who, who's bold enough to say, I feel like we're doing a pretty good job partnering and ministering to our parents? Any, anyone? Is, everybody feels, trust me, <laughs> trust me, we're doing a good job. <laughs> Don't worry, calm down, calm down. <laughs> Who is trying and you're having a hard time getting traction? Share some of the stuff that you guys are doing. Even though, even though you're going, it's, it's not getting the traction we want, but here's some stuff we're doing. Just basic communication with the parents in, a, in, a, in an email and getting very little response yeah. is an indication of like how they're involved in, in their kids' yeah. you know, lives. Not that they're not, but... You know, as far as like small group goes. Right. Yeah. It's shocking. It's I mean, the same ones that respond. Yeah, it's the same it's ones. Of, it's the same ones. Out of a thousand or yeah. 15 yeah. Or it's shocking how much even good parents, they just mm -hmm. don't they don't give you feedback. Mm -hmm. They don't respond to the email. It, it, it's really interesting. We uh we did, we made a change this year uh programmatically where once a month uh, we did something called a fuse night. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just very little traction. Andy Stanley has a great quote that I think applies to parent ministry. He says, "Do for the." Well, I, he this is what he says, and then I'm gonna change it back. He says, "Do for the many." Uh, gosh, I'm gonna butcher his quote. Uh, my age, my my. my <laughs> do for the few what you wish you could do for the many. Yeah. Right. Um, it's a great principle. And if you think about parent ministry, that helps, right? You do, you do a parent workshop and a few show up. You know what? You do for those few what you wish. You wish they would all respond to, but they're not all responding to it. Uh, I think parent ministry, more than, more than any other ministry in our church, is a felt need ministry. You've got to get lots of hooks in the water. Don't, don't give parents just one avenue that they have to travel in order to benefit from your wisdom and your concern and your communication. Put as many hooks in the water as you possibly can, and parents will pick and choose what, what appeals to them. Some parents don't want to come to a parent meeting, but they'll respond to an article that you send in an email that, that talks about the same stuff that you covered in a, in a, in a parent meeting. Some, some parents are, are big readers, and they'll read whatever book you, you recommend, but they're, they're not going to come to the parent of a teen support group. Um, and so to try to put as many hooks in the water as you can, I think, um, is, you know, consumerism, whatever. You know, sometimes you, you, you have to recognize the ideal would be, man, I just wish they would trust me and work with our parent ministry system. That's the ideal. Makes it easier for me and probably better for them. The real is they're busy and living frantic lives and... I think they just want, I think parents want two things. They want hope and they want help. And they just want a little bit of both. They just want some hope and help. Hope is hang in there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you're not the only one whose daughter rolls her eyes at you when you ask her to take out the trash. Your son's not the only one who's getting C minuses even though last year he was getting A's. Doesn't mean he's on crack, right? <laughs> um, you're, you're not the only one. You're, you're not the only one struggling through this thing. Most parents feel like they're the only one. I'm the only one. Nobody else gets it. Everybody else gets it. Every other parent of a teenager gets it. You, just, you give them a little bit of hope. Hang in there. There's light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to make it. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of parents just like you have come through the other end. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of teenagers going through the same stuff your kid's going through. It has, they've come out okay. That's the hope. The help is... By the way, here's a blog post you might be interested in. By the way, we do have a quarterly parent meeting that talks about some stuff that I can tell you're, you're, you're concerned about. By the way, here's, here's a dad in our church who went through the exact same thing with his son three years ago, 
and he's, he would love to take you to coffee and, and, share his, and share his story with you. Just a little bit of hope, a little bit of help. Put lots of hooks in the water. That, that's our strategy. That, that's, that's how we're doing it. We just can't be all things to all parents. Um, one, of our, one of our overarching goals is to never drive a wedge. We've added to, we should just say don't drive a wedge. Now we say we provide hope, help, and harmony is our third H, which is we try to do what we can to keep the harmony in the home. So when we charge way too much for an event, that causes disharmony in the home. When we change dates on the calendar, that, charge, that causes disharmony in the home. When we do too many activities or put pressure on kids who are sports-minded, that if you're a good Christian, you wouldn't play club soccer, that puts disharmony in the home. Um, when we make comments like, I can't believe your parents won't let you see Hunger Games, that puts disharmony in the home. When we show a PG-13 movie, a youth event, that puts disharmony in the home. Not in every home, but it puts disharmony in some of the And so we're doing what we can to provide hope, help, and harmony. And, and we mess it up all the time, but um, that's, that's been kind of where, where we're going with that. Other thoughts, we'll move on. Other thoughts on parent stuff? Um, we're fine. I think you, you, we say all the time that the parents are a key to their kids' faith. I think we're in a very post-Christian culture in inner city Philadelphia. I find that the opposite is also true. Like when a teenager has authentic faith and their parents are complete pagans, they're the key to bringing their parents to yep. faith. So we're, we're dealing with that all the time. Yeah. It's like the kid is the one that's really following Christ. Their parent has nothing to do with it. But right. all of a sudden, they become the key. And we see, I think the best way, I would say the best way to reach adults is through kids and through teenagers. Totally. In a post-Christian culture. Yeah. Which, by the way, is why a church like ours builds a $20 million youth building is because we know that there's a whole lot of parents, not just, in, not just in urban settings, but there's a lot of upper middle class suburban professional parents who their kid does lead up. And if their kid goes, man, this church I got invited to is awesome, dad, you should check it out, it's really cool. Dad, some dads will say, okay, heck, if they, love, if, if they care about my kid that much, they're gotta be, or, or they'll just come to check it out out of curiosity, right? Um, so I, I think you're, you're totally true that one of the best ways to reach parents is, is to reach their kids. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on. We'd love, I'd love to talk more about that as, as, we, as we can. Um, number 10, we'll go back to this, balance is a myth. Why do we try so hard to have margin and balance? Why, why have we been taught the, the importance of that? We've read books on it. We've been reminded of it. We've been told without it, you're going to burn out. Your marriage is going to suffer. Your ministry is going to suffer. The person who burns a candle on both ends isn't as bright as he thinks he is. We've heard all of those, all that stuff. And it rings true. I think it's just what you said about burnout. I think we're afraid of burning out. Like we've seen other people crash and burn and their families crash and burn. And so we're so afraid of that. And so I think we kind of overcompensate sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Too far. yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, we've seen, I mean, we, we've seen firsthand right. what ministry can do to families and to people. And as people who love our families and ministry, we're like, well, I'm going to protect that. It's not on my watch. When you hear me say it's a myth, it's a whole bunch of you guys voted on that one, even some of you didn't, like what, what feelings or what pushbacks, what bubbles to the surface when you hear somebody say, balance is a myth? As a volunteer, I don't have balance in my work life working 60 hour weeks and then try to do volunteer ministry on top of that. There's only so much energy to go around. Yeah, so you're saying you actually resonate with the statement more than, yeah. okay. But, but still want that. Right, right. Because, because, because of your because crazy. The, you know, God, God does call you to, to reflect and take time. Yes. And get into the word and get into prayer. And to your fake it part is that oftentimes we're, we're running so fast, we don't then dedicate the time to that. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I would say... Balance sounds like self-control, and then the idea of it being a myth sounds like out of control. Gotcha. 
So you're just pushing against, you're pushing back a little bit against how you define balance. Right, right. If, right? You, you like, need to find this self-control and... Right, yeah. like balance. It seems like I need to spend yeah. time with my family yeah. also on top yeah. of that. And if there is no balance, yeah. somebody's got to suffer. Yeah. Here's what I think the picture, hold on, I'll come, that's, that's for later on. There you go. Oh, there you go. Um, that's the picture that we're, that's what balance looks like, as I, as, I, as I have been taught, is that there's a few things. There might be more than four boxes, but there's a few things in our life, right? And there's, there's our ministry life, our family life, our personal life, our friends. And what balance says is, by definition, balance says they all must be perfectly harmonious, I mean, that's, you know, if we're going to get technical, balance is balance. Um, and so we, we've decided that, well, there's a time and a place for each one. I need to give each one their proper attention. What we know to be totally true is that ministry always, always, the nature of ministry leaks into everything else. Ministry cannot be contained. Parents call you on your day off. Kids get in an accident, get rushed to the hospital the day before you're leaving on vacation. Somebody, somebody calls and there's a, a memorial service right scheduled for the same time that your son's soccer tournament. I mean, I mean, you cannot box in ministry. It's not a nine to five. But, you know, I wish it was. My son works for Chick-fil-A. He's never gotten a call from Chick-fil-A on his day off saying, Ah, oh, the deep fryer's not working. Cool, you're an expert on the deep fryer. Come in and fix me. He never, they, you know, they figured out. He's never once. We get those deep fryer calls all the time. All the time. What we end up doing because of the pursuit of margin and balance is we spend a whole lot of time, I think too much time, trying to force ministry back where it belongs. I can't let it overtake my family. I can't let it overtake my, my personal life. I must force it back, and it refuses to be forced back. So therefore, I think we're fighting a losing battle. I think it's a noble battle. It's a battle we have to figure out. But when we pursue margin and balance, we're trying to push the box back into place that refuses to be pushed back into place. So what do we do? I would just recommend a different paradigm. Don't pursue margin and, and balance. Pursue health. You, you, you have to be healthy. You have to have healthy families. You have to have healthy friendships. You have to have a healthy personal life. You have to have a healthy spiritual life. You have to be healthy. But you don't have to have margin and balance to be healthy. I think if we can, if we can. Now, here's the thing. I'm not proposing this for everybody. Some of you, you've got balance and margin pretty well figured out and it's working pretty well for you. Others, that has been a pressure that you've felt the whole time. I'm saying there is another way to define it. There's another way to look at it. And I'm completely okay going, it's a big quagmire that's very hard to separate. And ministry is an all-in proposition. When I want to get super spiritual, and super guilt-ridden with people who are obsessed with balance and margin, I say, show it to me in the life of Jesus. I mean, yeah, I know he escaped to pray. But where, I mean, he, when he says, when he says, let the dead bury the dead, when he says, unless you hate your family, when he says, um, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back isn't fit for the kingdom, when he says the foxes and the birds, those, all those wild animals have places to lay their heads, and the Son of Man has... They all have homes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I mean, he, he, was, he was in, and he was calling people to be crazy in, and there's just not a lot of balance and margin in, in, the, in the mission that, that Christ was on. Um, but he was very healthy. He was a pretty healthy guy. Um, I think it's about rhythms and seasons. There's times when you're going to be a fantastic dad and you leverage those times like crazy and a present mom and you leverage those times like crazy and there's times where you're going to be a little bit absent. The week before summer camp and the week of summer camp, I'm a terrible dad. I'm not present. The week after summer camp, I'm the world's greatest dad. 
and I'm a terrible church employee the week after summer camp. I'm the world's greatest church employee the week before summer camp, right? There's seasons and rhythms, and you figure it out, and, 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 and you just determine, I'm going to be healthy. The beautiful thing about those of you who are in full-time ministry, Brian, this doesn't help, this doesn't help you. The beautiful thing about those of you who are in full-time ministry is most of you guys have the freedom to get creative. Most of you. You can cut out at 3 o'clock and nobody's to hunt you down. Right? You, I mean, that's why youth ministry is great. We can coach our kids' soccer teams because we can cut out of the office at 3 o'clock a couple days a week and nobody's really asking. Now, we make up for that because the phone rings, the deep fryer phone call comes on Saturday. So le leverage it. Take advantage of the freedoms that you've been given. Um, and, and when you do that, you might not ever find balance, but I think you can find health. Uh, and I, I just separate those, I separate those two. Thoughts on that? Pushbacks? Yes ands? What about? I feel like when I was a kid in age group, it was the people who brought me into their family life that meant the most. I wasn't put into this box of, now we'll minister you to Cassandra. It was, come grocery shopping with me. Let's go do whatever. And that meant so much to me. Yeah. That was my time to Yeah. And so that's taught me in my youth ministry. Stay with me. I don't have to cut out this two hour after I will say this and we'll move on. This is grumpy old man. I preface it. This is grumpy old man. The, the younger you are and the more single you are, and this is going to fly in the face of what most of you guys have been taught, but I'm getting on a plane. You won't see me. Um, the younger you are and the more single you are, the less you deserve balance and margin. You're not entitled to it. So when we get interns at Saddleback Church, you say, oh, I'm sorry, Kurt. Um, that's my day off. Bull crap. I don't care if it's your dad. I don't, my, my leadership philosophy is I don't care, but I don't care. I don't care that you coach your son's soccer game. I don't care that you go to the dentist on church time. I don't care that you're setting your fancy football lineup on the church computer at 11 o'clock on a, on a work day. I don't care. But I don't care that I ask you to come do something on your day off either. I don't care that we're going to go up to a funeral the day before you go on vacation. I don't care, but I don't care. It's, it's just it's ministries, and I don't care, but I don't care thing. And when you're young, you're, you're, you're going to be busy. The, 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 the problem with most of these balance books is they're, written, they're all written by guys like me at the, top of the, at the top of the heap who I can, just to be completely honest, I can have as much margin and balance as I choose to have. My direct supervisor is Rick Warren, and he doesn't like to supervise people. <laughs> I have no boss. I can, I can be as balanced as I want, and by the way, every time I choose to protect my right for balance, all that crap trickles downhill, and I'm perfectly balanced at the expense of somebody else who now has to navigate their chaos because I choose to be perfectly balanced. But I can be perfectly balanced. When you're young and trying to figure it out, it's very hard, and I would just suggest quit trying for a while. Just, 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 just embrace it. Just go with it. I know you make some bad habits. That's what people are concerned about. You make bad habits when you're young and you'll have to unbreak them. I, I'm, I'm saying I'm not sure you have to unbreak them. I'm not sure why we can't just be really hard workers with a strong ministry ethic our entire career and just be healthy and pursue health at all costs and recognize that there's seasons and ebbs and flows and that's part of, that's part of it. Just thoughts, not the gospel. <laughs> And I'm um, flying out right now, Ed. If you can get me out of the room right now, I'd appreciate that. Um, I'll do these other two real quick, and then we'll, we'll move on. We'll take our break. Um, put people in a box and expand the box. I think this is, I, I, I like it, because I think I kind of came up with it, but therefore I think I'm a genius. Um, I think we're all in the same box. So if I look at my ministry team, I've been at Saddleback Church for 18 years. I'm the student ministries pastor. I'm in a box. There are parameters outside of which I cannot minister or else I will lose my position at Saddleback Church or I'll get in trouble. So one parameter would be a purpose-driven paradigm. I have, to be, I have to do purpose-driven ministry at Saddleback Church. Another parameter would be all of our like, safety and Paul, our, our safety procedures and you know, no one-on-one no -on -one ministry. I'm not, one of them for, for me would be our um, code of conduct. I'm not allowed to smoke tobacco or drink alcohol or be in a car or any place like that alone with a woman. I can't ride to lunch with a, another lady. 
There's, there's, that's, I cannot, I can't violate that. I might think it's stupid, but I can't violate it. Another box for us, for our student, would be maybe our values. Like, whatever, I'm in a box. A volunteer who joins our team outside of the, our volunteers don't have to sign the, the conduct thing, but I can come up with a box that's the exact same for me, that's the exact same for a volunteer who's 19 years old who joins my team tomorrow. We are in the exact same box. I don't have any more freedom to run outside of that box than he does, even though I'm Kurt Johnson who's been there for 18 years. The difference is the box for me is massive. I have tons of freedom to roam around and be creative and try new things inside the box. When somebody joins my team as a 19-year-old volunteer, they get about that much freedom. Don't think on your own. Don't come to me with any ideas on your own. <laughs> Don't ask dumb questions. You have this much freedom to run around. And then after you've shown that you're trustworthy, you've got a little bit more freedom to run around. We have Gary Iltz, who's a 50, almost 60-year-old volunteer. He was volunteering in our junior high ministry before I came to Saddleback Church. We're, we're both in a box. He has almost unlimited freedom to run around. Great idea, Gary. My answer is yes, Gary. Yes, Gary. Great idea, Gary. Go for it, Gary. Oh, you don't want to be part of a purpose-driven youth ministry, Gary? Well, you, then this isn't the place for you. Right? You don't want to you don't want to re-up your background check every four years or whatever it is, then then you can't you can't be a volunteer. It's the same box for everybody. If you want to empower your leaders, you put them in the box, let them know, and then as trust, what empowerment is is just expanding the box and giving them more and more and more and more freedom to run around inside the box. But you get to determine, for the most part, what the parameters of the box happen to be and then leave them wanting more. Um, uh, is, is, it, is it David? No. Yeah, David, David thank you. Um, David did a perfect example of leave us wanting more. He did two I Can Fly videos. He could have done five and we would have been laughing. If he would have done 35, we, by 35 we're like, crap, I never want to see another I Can Fly video, <laughs> right? I, I'm dying for more I Believe I Can Fly videos because he left me wanting more. Um, nine Square in the Air or Gaga Ball or whatever, Kill Ball, whatever game is your student's favorite, it will quickly become the game they never want to see again if you bust it out week after week after week after week. Leave them wanting more. Where's Gaga Ball? Oh yeah, we, we, only, play, we only bring out the Gaga Ball court once a month. What? Ah, oh, crap. What, what, when's it coming back? I'm going to make sure I'm at church that night because they, they don't want to miss Gaga Ball. If you do a, a kill ball tournament every Friday night, your kill ball tournament attendance will go from this to this because they'll get tired of it. Right? Leave them wanting more. The power of a 15-minute youth message. A, if you can't say it in 15 minutes, you probably can't, you're probably saying too much. Just, we're not talking about that. But, um, B, nobody ever complained about a short sermon. In the history of Christendom, no one ever complained about a short sermon. You leave them wanting more. Guys, come back next week, and we're going to keep, we're going to keep talking about this a little bit. Oh, gosh, okay. Right. Well, if they don't come back next week, I've got to say everything this week. If you leave them wanting more, they're more likely to come back next week. Your, your training of your volunteers, leave them wanting more. Less is more. Don't have three-hour training meetings. Do high fives. A five-minute training meeting before youth group starts. Leave them wanting more. Just look for ways, less is more, leave them wanting more. We tend to do the opposite of that. We, we, we typically, once we see something that works, we just do more and more and more and more of what works, and then we wonder, why isn't that working anymore? Because too much candy makes people sick. Um, and then, balance of myth, people's numbers matter. Oh, numbers matter. That's, a, that's an interesting one that, that, that got so many votes. I think we just feel the pressure, don't we? We just feel attention. What, what will help us... Uh, uh, let, me, let me phrase a question and we'll take our break in a minute. How are you navigating that, that tension? I mean, it's a real tension. Most of you aren't in churches 
where if you don't have any growth numerically for the next five years, most of you aren't in churches where that won't matter at all. Most of you are in churches where they're at least kind of, that's what, that's what you do is you kind of reach more kids. How are you navigating that? Are you navigating that? What, how many, how, I'm trying to think of the right question. Maybe, I don't, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm overthinking it. I think maybe we just voted for it because I, we recognize that tension. We don't know what to do about it necessarily. For me, I put it on there because I don't have an answer. I'm just trying to break a couple myths. The balance myth, I think, is important to break at some level. At some level. I think the numbers don't matter. The books that you're... Numbers don't matter. They don't matter. They don't theoretically matter. Pragmatically, they matter a whole lot. And we just got to acknowledge it. Because if you try to convince your elders and your senior pastor that numbers don't matter, you're fighting a losing battle. So I don't have the answer as much as I... It's a shot over the bow of idealism saying, guys, wake up. It matters. It matters. It's kind of a bummer that it matters, and it's kind of okay that it matters, but, but it matters. Would you espouse the belief that if you do the right faithful things, like what you put on the whiteboard behind, growth and fruit will follow? So if the growth and fruit aren't following, is it evaluating, you know, what, okay, what are we not maybe pursuing yeah. as faithful as we think we are? Yeah. I mostly believe that health causes growth. I mostly believe that. Um, but there's exceptions to every rule. So, I mean, there's people doing really healthy ministry and they're just not seeing growth. Um, so I mostly believe it. And I mostly believe that if you're not seeing growth, there's, there's something unhealthy. Mostly. But not completely. Um, now, what I, what I do believe more than anything else, it, it's very hard to sell our bosses on this, but if I were to write one word that's the measure of your success, most people are going to put, let's play hangman, um, most people are going to say, they'll, they'll put a, a, a spiritual spin. They won't just say attendance, but they'll say whatever it is, baptisms, or how many kids have gone on mission, but it's all numbers. I mean, the baptism pressure, I'm in a Southern Baptist church, the baptism pressure is bigger on me than the attendance pressure. I'm like, baptizing, you've been baptized six times? Come on in, I just got to count you. I mean, it's, it's crazy, it's crazy. So here, here's, I mean, and I'll, 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 we'll head into break with this because I believe this to be true. I believe this is what matters to God. And I think if we can, if we can hold on to this, and even when we're under all the other pressure that we feel, what the measure of success that's it faithfulness that, that, that's the measure of success you be faithful you be faithful doing what God's called you to do you be faithful where he's planted you you water the grass in your on your side of the fence you be faithful to your wife you be faithful to your family you be faithful to your calling you just do what you know you're supposed to do and sometimes the numbers follow and sometimes they don't. But if you're faithful, you know, you're going to stand before the Lord someday. And he's not going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant who baptized more students in 2013 and 2012. He doesn't have a, he's not going to have a because. He's, the because is this. Well done. You were faithful with a little. Well done. If we can do that, it kind of, you know, there's a little thread running, right? It's the most basic stuff. Be John Miller in the life of a kid. Be faithful. And, and, and you're fulfilling the calling and you're doing what God's asked you to do. Everything else is not wasted time, but almost, almost wasted time.